From CVP here in Cincinnati, Ohio, it's the Doc to Doc podcast. Short videos to keep you up to date and connected to CVP physicians across the country. I'm Dr. Lori Proventure. All right, welcome back. It's great to have you all listening in again. Today, I am so honored to have Dr. Bob Osher with us. And he's a very special guest with this series of Show Me Your Routine FACO, because really he was the one that came up with this idea. Dr. Osher is a professor at the University of Cincinnati. He's also medical director emeritus at CEI. He's the editor of the video journal for cataract surgery. And I also- And, and, and a nearly scratch golfer. Oh, right, yeah. I heard he just won a local golf tournament, right. golfing a 75, yeah. which yeah. for those of us not familiar is like doing a one minute FACO. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I have a, when my hands start to shake, I have an alternate career coming up. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. So it's truly an honor to have you with us. I'm just like everyone else asking you to show us a routine FACO. So we will go ahead and roll the tape. Hilari, it's a pleasure to participate. I believe that the incision is so important and I like a three-plane incision. I make a groove and then an uphill tunnel and then once I've made my tunnel I will insert a keratome and I'll make uh, a third plane which is a carpenter's lap joint and I'll flare the incision so it's 2.2 on the outside 2.4 on the inside and then I'll fill the eye with heel on five that's my OVD of choice. I'll put an imprint on the cornea for my capsular rexus. Uh, and I have always made the capsular rexus with a needle. This is a safety rexus technique where I basically turn one of the edges around. So I always have a second chance, although I never use it. And then I make a very slow rexus. Um, when you go through hill on five, it's hard to be too fast, at least with a needle. But it's not a horse race, and it doesn't matter to me. The capsular guide gives me uh, the same size rexus pretty much every time. So the edges cover the optic. And I always finish outside the starting point. And then the next step would be the hydrodissection. And I make sure the lens is loose, because if the lens is loose, I know the case is going to go more smoothly than if it's not. I blot the lens so it lets the fluid back out from behind and, and I'm rotating to make sure that it is loose and I refill with Helen 5. That deepens the chamber. I aim to the middle of the pupil and make my second stab. Now I'll go into the incision. There's only a tooth on that one shaft so I don't mark the epithelium. And this is my own favorite bevel down phaco so I make sure all the energy goes backwards and not at the cornea, and I just outline where the rexus is, and that way I'll never hit the edge of the rexus accidentally. Now I'm gonna just go into the lens, into the nucleus, and make a few uh, runs, bevel down, and I don't push the lens, I make sure that it's an in situ groove. And when I get about halfway through the nucleus, I'm going to make a couple of changes to begin with, all the energy's gone backwards, so now I'm down deep and it doesn't matter. So I can turn the tip around. And when you sculpt, you don't occlude. So I'm gonna bring the vacuum way down so I'll never go through the nucleus accidentally. And it also leaves the OVD in the anterior chamber. So the helon five is there the whole time. The cornea really doesn't know I'm working. And I'll just take my time and sculpt down deeper. I like to point out to the fellow who's sitting in the same room as we are now, that the anatomy of the lens, the Y sutures, and uh, so I know where I am in the lens, and then I'll just simply use a, a divide technique and crack the lens into two hemispheres. I'll rotate the lens, and then I'll embed in the lower half of the lens and chop. And I like to chop very simply the hemisphere into quarters. I'll tip the quadrant up, and with the quadrant up, I can stay in the deepest part of the chamber, bring everything into the center, and then I'll harvest the quadrant. I always work, or try to always work, adjacent to another piece. And that way the other piece is holding the posterior capsule back. 
I use slow motion parameters. I've always been a surgeon that likes to work at low parameters. I don't like anything to happen fast inside the eye, and to me, it's not a horse race. I want everything to be ultimately safe. And I'm going to turn the lens now. And I'll do the exact same thing. I'll go into the lower half of the lens and I'll embed. I'll just give a short burst of FACO to impale the lens. And that makes it very easy to crack the hemisphere into quadrants. Once again, tipping the apex up. Once again, working adjacent to the next quadrant in the deepest part of the chamber and taking my time and watching the posterior capsule. If I see any trampolining, I'll raise the bottle, but I don't see trampolining most of the time and the third quadrant will come out very easily. You can see that little piece is stuck in the OVD. Nothing gets to the cornea. Energy doesn't, pieces don't. And now for the last piece, there's not another quadrant to protect the capsule. So for the final quadrant, I'll put the second instrument behind the last bit. So if I did get a sudden trampolining effect, which we usually don't get with Centurion, uh, but it can happen, at least I won't ever impale the capsule accidentally. And now the nucleus is gone. The chamber's been deep the whole time, and the cornea never knew we were working because the chamber is full of HELON-5. And that's what I can do with lower parameters. Now I take the, the cortex, always the subincisional cortex first. Um, it makes sense not to take the, the chicken approach and go across the eye. I've been saying that for decades, and uh, that's because the cortex is holding open the bag. And if you wait to do the subincisional cortex till last, the bag is closed, and it's much more difficult. We only engage the most proximal anterior sleeve of cortex because if you engage the posterior sleeve, you're going to get little ribbons and things that are not very sociable. So this way I'm going to just try to get various meridia crystal clear. And again, I'm not a fast surgeon. I just take my time and work my way around. And then when the final piece is out, I'll inspect. If there's any cortex that's left, I'll go after it with a dry technique, but there's not. So I've always polished very carefully and thoroughly the central capsule. And then once the central capsule is done, I'll go ahead and polish the peripheral capsule because my son's a retinal specialist and he insists on a good view of the periphery. And like every respectful father, I try to obey. It's nice to have Jamie with me because I keep my complications in the family. <laughs> and now all the capsule is completely clear. If I have loose zonules or something that makes me concerned about capsular phimosis and that potential, I will polish the anterior capsule, but I don't do that routinely. Now I put in my Helon to deepen the capsule uh, and then Helon 5 to tauten the whole eye and I use counter-traction with AutoCert, or now I'm using uh, Clarion with Autonomy to inject the lens. This is my doll-fingered Y-hook. I designed this in the early 1980s. It's still my favorite instrument because it's doll-fingered. It manipulates the lens, but it can't tear anything. And now I hydrate the incision. I always hydrate before I take out the OVD, and that's because Helon 5 is so effective masking positive pressure that I don't like surprises. And if I hydrate the incision, even with severe positive pressure, I've got a much better chance of keeping the chamber deep if I've hydrated the first. I take out the OVD from behind the lens and then from in front of the lens. Uh, Helon 5 is very cohesive at high shear rates and it's easy to remove it completely. Before I pull out, I inject a little myocol because I want to make sure the pupil's down and I can absolutely center the optic where the pupil is whether it's toric or multifocal, it doesn't matter. I want to be perfectly centered. Hydrate again, check the incision, and the next day I expect the cornea to be clear, and I expect the patient to have excellent uncorrected vision. So I thought of a few questions, so before I forget any of them, 
Um, you make your paracentesis a little later than most surgeons, I'd say. What's the reasoning for that? Because the incision is the most important way to begin the operation. It's like the alphabet. If A isn't right, then B is bad, C is catastrophic, and D is a disaster. So I want my best virgin eye when I make my three-plane incision. And I know that most people will do their stab incision first, but to me, I want the firm, normal, tensive eye when I do my incision construction. And then I can refill after my rexus and hydrodissection and refilling with OVD, that maximizes my chamber depth so when I make my stab, there's not a chance I'm gonna hit the anterior capsule, particularly if I'm aiming toward the middle of the pupil. So to me, that just makes sense, but I have no problem with people doing it the other way around because there's a lot of ways to skin a cat and people should do whatever they're comfortable doing as long as they understand and have a reason for doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. What about um, your hydrodissection cannula? What type was that? It looked a little They're all mine. Unique. Every instrument okay. is mine. Okay. And uh, I get no royalties, so I can say that. Um, but the reason I designed that cannula was because uh, many years ago, in the 1980s, when hydrodissection was first developed, Robert Drews did a study in cadaver eyes where he injected milk with a 30-gauge cannula, and you could actually water pick the capsule. So to me, the most effective, safe way of hydrodissection is a broad, gentle stream that does the work. So it's at 45 degrees, so because it's angled like that, by just turning it over, I can hit here, I can hit here, and if I angle my wrist at all, I can even hit down here if I've got a corticocapsular adhesion or something where I need additional hydrodissection. Okay, great. Um, more of a comment, but I love how you describe uh, cortex as sociable. Yeah. <laughs> when trying to get Sometimes it to go. Sometimes it's not, is it? Yeah, that'll definitely pop in my mind again in the future. But then you mentioned at the end that you use myocol to bring the pupil down. Is that typically a physiologic location that the pupil ends up at? Or? Yes, Okay. it does. Because I've argued for years and years with Jack Holliday on the visual axis, the optical axis, mm -hmm. the geometric axis, and I'm not smart enough from an engineering perspective to know those def definitions well. But I do know that if I bring the pupil down and the lens is perfectly centered, even in a small pupil of a patient on Flomax with a, a multifocal lens, the next day it's going to be perfectly centered. It is not going to budge or move. So to me, that really works well. Plus, I use Callisto, which is a Zeiss technology. Again, I'm not financially involved, but it tells me where the actual visual axis is from the preoperative testing. So when I look through my interface and my microscope, I can actually see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or things you'd want to add for us to know about? No, I just think that I'm on the ascending part of my career and getting uh, uh, still love what I do and I have um, no intention of uh, stepping aside uh, until I start to develop some complications or things that make me feel that I'm... Or you become uh, a golf pro. <laughs> yeah, ready to be let out to pasture. But I, I thank my lucky stars that I picked the subspecialty I did. I got the privilege of working with my dad for 18 years. I've worked with Jamie. Uh, and it's to me, it's been like hitting the lotto. And every day has been a good day. Well, I know it's a true honor to work with you all the time. And um, thank you for coming on this and gracing us with another, yet another Bob Osher video that we can learn from. Um, so we'll look forward to the next few videos here in this series, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you for inviting me, Laurie. It's a pleasure. Next up, I have Dr. Mike Nordlin. He is the chair of the Clinical Governance Board for CBP Midwest and a very busy cataract surgeon and cornea surgeon. And Dr. Nordland, I've heard you're a wizard in the OR, so oh. I'm thrilled to have you so I can see one of your routine FACO cases. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's go ahead and roll the tape. So, uh, you know, I, like most people, I start my cataract surgery with a paracentesis. I'm right-handed, so I make a left-handed paracentesis for my second instrument. I use 1% preservative-free lidocaine to anesthetize the ocular surface, and I also use it inside the eye intracamerally to uh, provide additional anesthetic. My preferred uh, viscoelastic is duovisc, so I'm injecting visco viscote into the anterior chamber to protect the endothelium and to stabilize uh, the anterior segment structures. And I also use it to coat the ocular surface to keep the eye from desiccating 
uh, and it also mitigates uh, the need for the uh, technician to constantly be irrigating. It does take a minute for it to smooth out. 2.2 uh, millimeter keratome is used to make a triplanar incision at the temporal limbus. And I'm, I'm finicky about my capsule rexus, so I want them to be as close to 5.5 millimeters as I can. I use a 6 millimeter capsule rexus marker just to give me reference um, because I do think sometimes the optics make it easy for you to make it too big or too small. Uh, cystotome to start my uh, capsule rexus and then a utrata forceps to uh, finish that around. What's that second instrument you have there in the paracentesis? So I call it a push-pull. So once it's engaged in the paracentesis, I can move the eye left, right, front, back. Um, and it, uh, it, because it's topical anesthesia, if a patient wants to move quickly while I'm doing the rexus, I just, it keeps their eye from moving. Hydrodissection with a 25-gauge uh, hydrodissection cannula uh, until I've got the nucleus freely rotating in the bag. And then for phaco emulsification, uh, like most people uh, at CEI uh, use uh, the Alcon um, Centurion system uh, and uh, uh, it's almost 100% torsional ultrasound, so uh, I do use the Osel system. So when occlusion is is uh, when you're approaching occlusion with the current vacuum settings, a little bit of longitudinal ultrasound will kick in, and then I use a divide and conquer technique. Uh, so here I'm grooving uh, a central groove. And this is an angled Osher or angled Kuglin that I use as a second nucleus is divided in half. And then depending on how dense the lens is and also how much space I have, so in small eyes and in really dense lenses, I'll divide the lens into six uh, segments instead of four. In a bigger eye or softer uh, lenses, I'll, I'll just divide it in four. And I just want to have the pieces uh, a size that I can easily manipulate them near the iris plane and not, and not threaten uh, the cornea. So. Uh, it varies from patient to patient how I will uh, dissect the, the nucleus. And then my goal when I'm removing these segments is I like to rotate, I grab the anterior portion of the fragment, rotate it so that the smooth posterior surface of that fragment is now horizontal to uh, the iris plane, and then just let it rotate on the, t on the edge of my, um, on the tip of my FACO uh, handpiece, and that way you're not having pieces chatter in all sorts of directions, and you don't have sharp, jagged nuclear edges up against the, the, the face in the cornea. You can see that, you know, through all of this time, we haven't had to put any additional uh, lubrication on the ocular surface. So this viscoat will last for the entire uh, case without any additional intervention by the technicians. I do like also this Lieberman speculum, which uh, is hinged nasally, so you free space temporally. Um, you know, with combo cases, I'll use the Lieberman, but I really uh, find it to get in. It often gets in the way as you're trying to make your approach. Uh, so I do like the the Sioni speculum. I use the silicone tip DNA handpiece uh, to do my cortical removal. After uh, I remove most of the cortex, uh, I do aggressively polish the posterior capsule. I try and get at least the central six millimeters. Uh, and then I uh, will remove the viscoat from the anterior chamber. And the reason I do this, I find that if uh, I re-pressurize the viscoat up against the uh, endothelium, 
much harder to get out later. So at this point, uh, I get out as much of the viscode as I can. It also is a, it's a good opportunity to get a lot of fluid moving to see if there's any nuclear chips or anything that might uh, that you might want to identify. So before you fill with provisc and before, really arshin off, shell that up against the cornea. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that's what I'm doing here is just making sure as much of the viscode is out is out is gone as can be. It can be real sticky, and if after you repressurize it. It can take a long time to get it out. And then refill the bag with ProVisc. And then I do something not everybody does. I use this anterior uh, capsule polisher to remove lens epithelial cells from the underside of the anterior capsule. And I do this for about 300 to 330 degrees. I, it's, this device is hard to get directly sub-incisional. Um, but not only does it make it look nice after surgery when you see these patients, but uh, it mit mitigates the risk of capsular phimosis. And uh, also, if there's a case where down the road you may have to do an IOL exchange, it makes re-entry and separating the anterior and posterior uh, leaflets of the bag uh, much easier. Currently using the Clarion uh, lens, but this is the pre precursor to that. It's the Alcon Auto uh, system, which is a WF uh, series implant uh, in a preloaded cartridge. Um, inject it in the bag, just make sure the trailing haptic is in the bag. And the, the haptics with the auto system, I find that the haptics do stick to the optic like that uh, more frequently than with a Monarch injector. Um, and then behind the lens to make sure we remove all the viscoelastic, I'll do this both inferiorly and superiorly. Are you intentional about orienting your haptics, nasal temporal? Yeah, good question. So I do on you know non-torque lenses, I try mm -hmm. and leave the, the haptics around the three and nine position. Minimize risk of that negative dysphotopsia. And then just make sure there's no viscoelastic uh, near the paracentesis or uh, sub-incisionally. So I'm trying to just irrigate. It's more of a flushing it out than mm -hmm. sucking it out to, to get that out. Um, come so out. You're holding your para open. Right yeah. Now. Hold, yeah. Yep. Okay. Hydrate my incision and my paracentesis, and then you know my goal is to leave the pressure around 30, uh, so f firmer than most uh, you know patients normally would rest, but not firm and um, not not going to cause problems later. It's a little soft. You definitely know your incisions are watertight when you have a slightly higher ending pressure like that. Yeah, and you know, it's a valved incision, so you want the pressure mm -hmm. to keep that valve, the incision mm -hmm. closed. Uh, and then I inject intracameral uh, cefuroxime uh, at the end of the case to reduce the risk of endophthalmitis. And do you still use post-op drops, antibiotic I, drops? I do. You do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because the, the when you look at um, endophthalmitis, uh, there are studies that show that at the end of surgery, if you take out some aqueous, there's, you can, that, that uh, it will grow in the culture just that there are bacteria in the eye at the end of case. And so cefuroxime will help with that. But then we have this smaller set of patients who develop endophthalmitis sort of in that second week, the seven to nine days. And probably that's bacteria getting in through the incision postoperatively. Hard to imagine it sat there for seven to nine days. So uh, the purpose of the topical antibiotic is to try and reduce bacterial uh, loads during that time you're waiting for the epithelium to really heal and seal that incision. Okay, great. That was a beautiful case. A um, few things that you've pointed out that we haven't had so far, just your attention to the cornea, which makes sense. So the viscoelastic on the surface, the, the visco in the AC, um, and then the way you flip the lens pieces is really interesting and unique. I haven't heard that before. Do you ever add viscote throughout the case if it's a really dense lens or you're noticing your CDE cranking up? 
Yeah, so really just based on the amount of viscoat that's in the eye. So uh, as you're on a denser uh, lens like that, um, you're going to see little pieces or even maybe air bubbles get trapped in the viscoat and they'll just be stationary. They won't move and you know that you've got a, a, a good bed of viscoat still in the eye. But if I see it come out or all of a sudden I see bubbles that are moving around the anterior chamber, I see little pieces that are then I stop and I'll reinflate. So that does happen on, you know, on the denser lenses where you have to crank up the power and the vacuum. Great. All right, well, thank you again for taking time to join us and showing your case. And we will have a few more cases for you guys coming up on Routine FACO, so we'll look forward to that. Well, thank you, thank you.